Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the America House Virtual Floor. My name is Lucy, and I'm the Program Manager here at America House Kiev, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you back to the continuation of our program, Creative Resilience in the Time of War. Today's session, titled Arts, Fashion, and Creativity, why they matter in wartime, bring together Ukrainian and American creatives to discuss this very issue. It's my absolute pleasure also to first introduce our Ukrainian speakers for the night. With us, we have the creative team, some of the members of the huge and incredible team behind the I Am You Are project. And our first speaker will be Nadia Pagava, and she is the Chief Operating Officer of Gogola Agency and also the Head of PR and Communications at I Am You Are. Nadia has a master's degree in international law and specializes in children's rights protection before switching to communications in order to promote Ukraine's oh. image at all possible levels. Since the first days of the full-scale invasion, Nadia, together with the team that remained in Ukraine, as well as teammates abroad, have been supporting and spreading the word about Ukraine's talents. Currently, she resides in Kiev. Welcome, Nadia. Also with us from Gogola Agency, we have Anna, who is the CEO and founder of the agency. She's also a co-founder of the I Am You Are project. She's a journalism graduate and also an acclaimed Ukrainian producer. Five years ago, Anna moved to Los Angeles to find Gogola, an international agency for brands communications. When the full-scale invasion broke out, Anna made a decision to continue supporting Ukrainian brands and help fellow Ukrainians to be featured prominently on the international stage. For this purpose, she founded the I Am You Are project, which united over 120 brands in fashion, tech, and culture under one group. Currently, she resides in Los Angeles. Very, you're very welcome tonight with us, Anna. And the last speaker from Ukraine, also a member of the IMU project, is Kristina Skripka. She's a hospitality expert, the founder of Foodies Agency, agency a co-founder, and also she is the co-founder of IMUR. With a background in education, Kristina is an established hospitality expert from Ukraine, known for the successful case of Bursa Hotel, an art-focused multidisciplinary project and a member of the Design Hotels community. As a co-founder of IMUR, Christina had a strong desire to bring modern solutions and strong Ukrainian DNA to the U.S. to showcase the power of Ukraine's creative talents. Currently, she resides in New York. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, it is also my pleasure to pass the microphone to our program co-organizers, Izzy Chan and Kirsten Hazard. All right. Hello, I'm Izzy Chen, a strategist, and I'm here with Kirsten Hazard, also a Hello. strategist. <laughs> We've been working together with the team at America House Kiev to organize these talks. And I want to introduce you to our American panelists today, Nicole Michelle's Madonna and Mike Hughes, both talented, multi award winning creative directors. Um, you can read about their many accomplishments on their websites. I just want to call out one thing that I admire for each of them that I feel is relevant for today's discussion. Now, Nicole, even though she's busy winning awards and judging awards, she always finds time to mentor and guide others in the industry, young ones, old ones, whoever needs advice and encouragement like me. So welcome, Nicole. And then Mike, in addition to his many years in advertising, he keeps his creative spark alive as a musician and has a magazine called Rotor that's about fashion and design. So welcome, Mike. Together with the IMUR team, we're going to have a great discussion today. So passing it back to you, Lucy. Thank you so much, Izzy. Before we go on to our first presentation of the day, just a few organizational details. Thank you so much to everyone who is joining and watching us live on our streams on the America House social media. For those of us in our Zoom webinar, please, you can um, ask your questions to our panelists through the Q&A function, and we will have a Q&A section and a discussion a bit later in the event. But please feel free to send in your questions, your remarks, your feedback throughout the entire event. And we look forward to hearing what you think and also your thoughts on the role of arts, fashion, and creativity in wartime and times of crisis. Mike, Nicole, uh, please take it further. Thank you very much. Um, I am, I'm really honored to be here um, uh, with my creative colleagues. 
um, we can put up the uh, presentation that we have. Yeah, so we'll we'll jump into this in a, in a beat, but uh, this is really a lot of our premise today. But as Mike said, you know, we're so honored to be here with Nadia, Anna, and Christina, and greetings to everyone in Ukraine and, and throughout the world. Um, this is a, a really, you know, worthwhile event and just a great way to, to connect um, as creatives around the globe. So Mike's going to start us off. Um, we're really not the main event today. Um, the, the team of Nadia, Anna, and Christina has been doing some incredible work to promote uh, Ukrainian brands and artists throughout the world. So we're going to try to keep our remarks brief, but hopefully bring you some inspiration around the topic of, of art, creativity, fashion, and, and resilience during adverse times. So Mike, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. You can kill a man, but you can't kill an idea. This is a, a quote from Medgar Evers. And this is really the catalyst for what Nicole and I are going to talk about today. Medgar Evers was best known as a civil rights activist and the NAACP's first field secretary in Mississippi. He was also a decorated US Army combat veteran who served in World War II. His death in 1963 ushered in movements and art on, on every level. Next slide, please. So that's really kind of the focus of our topic today. You know, how we can look at throughout history, the ways that ideas have survived. And particularly those ideas that were actually born from a time of personal crisis, of oppression, of conflict, of extreme adversity. Next slide. The best creative ideas are born on the edge of extreme tension. One example I like to use is something I've heard in the past in reference to a cello. You take wood, carve it down, bend it to a point where it's on the edge of breaking, just, just on the edge of breaking. You add strings to the wood, and once a bow is placed onto the strings and pulled, we witness the subtle beauty, the creativity that ends up moving us. But not only is the best creativity born on the edges of tension, the best creativity gets passed on on for others to use and adapt. Next slide, please. On the left is a modern artist by the name of Ben Venom, which we'll get to later. On the right next to him is my great uncle, Bob Flatley, who was a World War II fighter pilot. He flew a P-38 in the Pacific Theater. Both are linked directly to one another and both pushed up against something great. Next slide, please. World War II was the largest and deadliest conflict in human history, involved more than 50 nations, and was fought on land, sea, and air in every part of the world. It, it also was the birthplace of ideas that will never die, one of which is the battle jacket, which is an idea as much as it is a physical object. During World War II, Air Force pilots, such as my great uncle, wore flight jackets decorated with squadron insignia, some of which later contained pop culture icons of the day, surrounded by icons representing the sorties they flew, which was a glorified counter to what they were fighting against. After the war ended and these pilots came back home, they, um, they kept these jackets. A lot of them loved speed, as you can imagine, and started riding motorcycles so they used these jackets for motorcycle jackets because they offered a certain amount of protection. They soon started decorating their jackets with more insignias of clubs and gangs, which rapidly evolved into subcultures, each one pushing back against something. Think of the greaser type 50s motorcycle gang who rode Harley Davidson's. They naturally would butt up against the modern jocks who rode fancy Italian scooters. These two cultures clashed as there were two ideologies with opposing viewpoints. In the, the 60s ushered in rock and roll, and with it, the subcultures changed. Two that stood out were the gangster rebellious subculture who believed in defying social norms and the Woodstock era hippie culture who were more into self-expression but were also into defying social norms. These two branches of subcultures came together 
in the 70s to form a new wave of rock and roll. The emergence of punk and metal became synonymous with counterculture. That is to say, pushing back against the societal expectations thrust upon them. Moving into the 80s, whether it was the band Anthrax writing songs about how Native Americans were being mistreated, or Metallica's and Justice for All album, which broadcast political and legal injustice as seen through the prism of war and censored speech, the music was pushing up against something much larger than itself. And these battle jackets were the showcase for these things. All of this, born from the Air Force squadrons, from World War II. Next slide, please. Back to Ben, who has his own modern viewpoint on the battle jacket. Ben takes real used personal rock and roll memorabilia and parts of battle jackets and weaves them into quilts. The same type of quilt your grandmother might make to protect and comfort you. He has created a duality with the subject matter and in doing so has kept the idea alive. His ideas now live in galleries and museums all over the world. And by extension, the ideas put in place by people like my great uncle live in his work. The battle jacket was and is a flag that embodies the idea of creative resistance in counterculture, which in this example is the creative idea passed from generation to generation. Now we have some other examples. Nicole um, would love to take you through. Nicole? Thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike and I know each other for 20 years as, as friends and creative partners. He told me that story, I think, about a month ago, and it, it still gives me chills. So um, love, love hearing that. And such a great example of just how a, an iconic piece of fashion has really transcended time and culture. Um, so now we're going to jump into examples from two artists and one art form to show how art, again, uh, the best art comes out of that, that great adversity and crisis often. Uh, I think we're all familiar with this artist by now, certainly uh, those in, in Ukraine uh, due to some recent events and his appearance there, uh, but Banksy, uh, probably the most well-known street artist in the world. And this might be one of my personal favorite quotes about art. Art should comfort the disturb and disturb the comfortable. Certainly so true. Um, Banksy actually found his signature aesthetic during a moment of personal crisis. He was being chased by the cops and he was actually uh, hiding under a, a rubbish lorry, or as us Americans like to call it, a garbage truck, even though that doesn't sound as good. Uh, and he looked up underneath the bottom of the truck and he actually saw a stencil. And it was in that moment, he kind of had this, this unlock thought of, oh my God, doing a stencil would be way faster than doing the freehand graffiti that I'm doing now. And that will actually help me evade people who are chasing me um, you know, much more effectively. So if we go to the next slide. So that small, you know, somewhat humorous moment of personal adversity actually unlocked his artistic style, you know, for, for years and years to come. And now, of course, we see him all throughout the world on a mission to create art with the intention of breaking people out of whatever mental convention they are stuck in. You know, up in the left-hand corner there, we have, you know, an attack on the art world establishment. We certainly have examples of the brilliant work he did uh, in solidarity with the people of Ukraine, against the horrors of the war, against an oppressive dictator. Um, but what's so key to Banksy's work is it always pushes against something. Um, and there's a fantastic book. If you're if you a fan of Banksy, I, I recommend this. It's called Banksy, An Acceptable Level of Threat. And in that book, he reminds us how his work not only pushes against power in some way, but also gives voice to the powerless. Um, and the author says something very interesting, interesting about it. He says, this is the grand parody in all of Banksy's work. Through repetition and scale, any voice can become powerful, which just goes to show how flimsy the basis of power really is. Great street art reveals that process and makes it laughable. It shows how so much power is just theater using a certain symbol, design, or way of communicating. By laughing at the spectacle, we undermine its power and make room for a bit of original thought. So again, just a great example of pushing up against adversity of oppressive power to break through and make something amazing. Next slide, please. 
Um, this again, I think is a, a quote that is timeless. Um, you know, one of my favorite um, musical artists, uh, but this really takes us into a story about Keith Haring. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with Keith Haring, um, if you go to the next slide, um, I grew up a child of the eighties and I still remember exactly where I was standing when NBA legend Magic Johnson held a press conference to tell the world he had the HIV virus. And at the time, um, the AIDS crisis was one of the greatest challenges facing America and the world. And in the early days of that epidemic, people in power were not listening. And ACT UP was one of the first activist groups to demand attention and to demand funding for AIDS research. Um, and really, Keith Haring was an artist that paired with ACT UP to give them this unmistakable visual iconography. And it ended up really demanding the attention ACT UP needed and making a dent in culture and really making a difference. Um, this particular piece on the left is probably the most iconic piece from that movement. You know, ignorance equals fear, silence equals death. This piece is actually um, immortalized in the New York Public Library. And there's a beautiful plaque next to it that reads, it is through protecting, preserving, and engaging with creative work that we have a chance to spark new understanding. And Keith Haring's work was certainly an example, you know, of that spark that galvanized action and gave new understanding, you know, to um, the, the activism behind um, the, the AIDS movement. Sadly, in 1988, you know, Keith himself was diagnosed with AIDS, um, but his response to that diagnosis, and, and this was something that I just learned as I was, I was researching him, is just incredibly moving. Uh, and this is what he said. No matter how long you work, it's always going to end sometime. It wouldn't matter if you lived until you were 75, there would still be new ideas. You're making these things that you know have a different kind of life. Art doesn't depend on breathing. It lives longer than any of us will, which is sort of an interesting idea. It's sort of extending your life to some degree. Ironically, as Mike and I were, were talking about, you know, what we wanted to share today, just last weekend, American designer Tommy Hilfiger dropped a Keith Haring streetwear collection. So this is 30 years after Keith's passing. His art, his influence is still having an impact on culture and American fashion today. Next slide. So this is our last example, kind of pulling from the art world. And it's actually going to talk about an art form that is just incredibly fascinating. And again, that example, a very literal example of coming up against something that's actually broken um, and making it into something beautiful. So this is a Japanese art form called um, Kintsugi. If you go to the next slide. So as Mike set up so beautifully in the beginning, you know, we've talked about how art and creativity is formed by pushing and bending ideas to the edges until they almost break. And that is how beauty is forged. Um, in this Japanese art form, Kintsugi, uh, it's really pushed even one step further. Kintsugi takes the cracked, the broken, the destroyed, and finds beauty in that brokenness because the actual cracks of the pottery are repaired with a beautiful gold resin, which turns the repaired piece into something even more exquisite um, than it was to begin with. So it's really this incredible I mean, art form, but also a philosophy about finding beauty in the broken. Um, you know, and I know for most creatives and artists, and certainly for me, um, it's at the times when things can seem most broken or most bleak, um, cracked beyond repair, that we actually find the most interesting emotional truths, um, that we find the most breakthrough ideas and what really can connect us across culture. So I think, you know, whether it's, it's by life circumstance or by choice, when we are most challenged, it's when our best creativity, you know, really comes to the front. And oftentimes we find, you know, ideas we never expected. Uh, believe it or not, Kintsugi is still being practiced um, 600 years later. It's a, it's a six century old art form. And actually these two examples in the bottom are from Kintsugi Court, which was um, a, an art project done by artist Victor Solomon in South Los Angeles. He took a fractured public basketball court and applied the art of Kintsugi. He fixed the cracks with this incredible, beautiful gold resin. And he finished this project to coincide uh, with the restart of the NBA season in 2020 uh, after the pandemic. 
So, you know, I think the lesson learned from Kintsugi is that there will always be pieces of our world that are broken, that are oppressed. Um, there will always be conflict, you know, and, and the worst of humanity. But in that, you know, how can we as creatives and artists, you know, push and bend? Um, we, we lost a wonderful advertising icon uh, last year in America, George Lois. And one of the things he, I think, would have said in, in this uh, circumstance is, you know, how can creativity, which is the defeat of habit over um, originality, overcome everything? Mike, I'm going to pass it back to you just to wrap it up. Yeah, so, you know, um, in, in conclusion to, to what we've been talking about here, I just wanted to, to say, you know, your idea that you create an hour from now, a day from now, or a year from now will never die. And they will continue to live on for everyone to learn from. And I think that's a really important point, you know, that these ideas live on and on for people to learn from and adapt to. So I urge uh, creative individuals to keep creating and putting your ideas into the world. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mike and Nicole, thank you so much for leading us through an overview and really bringing forth these beautiful examples of how creative work can address and solve problems that exist in the world using practicality, using just the sense of ideas that people have and bringing them to the world. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. I'm very happy to go to our next presenters. And this is the team of IMUR, an incredible project from Ukraine. And they will tell you more about how they decided to address uh, and try to find a way the challenges that Ukrainians are facing today and that Ukrainian brands are facing today. Um, ladies, I'm very happy to pass the floor to you. Thank you so much. Um, hi, uh, hi. Yeah, I don't think I can hear my teammates, although, um, Chris, Anna, are you here? Yeah, we are here. We are here. Yeah. All good. So go through the presentation. We are happy to hear you. Sure. Okay. So briefly, um, at some point, um, IMUR was, uh, and now is one of the biggest events dedicated to the creative economy of Ukraine. Uh, which was very resonating with what uh, Nicole and Mike just spoke about, created through the challenges that um, we wouldn't say are they are hardly imaginable if you put any sane, sane mind to it. But um, I'm Yar went through lots of stress during creation. Um, Anna and Chris here um, at some point uh, decided that um they have to do something they have to support the creative industry and coming from the both creative and communicational background uh the team thought that there's no better way than to take ukrainian brands and showcase them in the us the country that has been showing so much support uh to ukraine throughout the way um and the project started it was it started quite small so it was uh we wanted to showcase ukrainian brands abroad but then uh thanks to um Anna and chris's creative minds and the team that uh, got into the project it kind of grew bigger and we found ourselves uh dreaming about the event that would host uh, 120 brands in different areas which is culture fashion and tech um and we wanted to take them to new york which is basically we didn't uh, we thought that this would be the best place to start. Um, on our way, we went through the challenges that are not only uh, connected with the war, but of course, these ones uh, in first turn, saying about all of our brands and projects being under constant shelling, which was very intense throughout autumn, which was one of our main preparation seasons. And of course, our creative team being divided between uh, several continents and constantly being also out of connection because uh, in Ukraine we constantly were experiencing blackouts or shelling once more, shellings once more. Um, so these were the types of complications that um, one wouldn't expect, but we also stumbled upon so many doubts on our way and people saying that this is not doable, you will not manage to uh, overcome lots of factors that stand in your way. Um, and then, of course, the complications with finding the partners and sponsors for the event, just because um, 
everybody thought that the project looked cool and felt cool, but um, until we actually implemented it into life, uh, not so many people were ready to take a leap of faith and support something that seemed so, so impossible because so many factors had, had to come together in order to make IMUR happen. But um, with this in mind, this is um, a big case study on how um, overcoming the doubts and how the challenges uh, that we face can make make something even even better and stronger. Uh, so I will scroll through the results that we got with IMUR and we're sure that there's a long way to go further. There's so much more to achieve, but um, this event is something that we worked on for nine months. And when it happened, we understood that there's a long way of representing Ukrainian projects in war and outside of war. So um, with IMUR, we, sorry, I'm going further. Yeah, with IMUR, we uh, presented 120 brands uh, in New York in an amazing location. Uh, and uh, and with, we've had five expo showcases, which rep represented different parts of Ukrainian culture and um, design and tech, which I will introduce a bit later. We've had the fair for four days. Uh, some of them were open and we've had lots of visitors which came to uh, almost 2000 tickets, but we've also had an amazing closed event with more guests than we could ever have expected. And this also came as a surprise because while we were inviting people, the response was good and we were expecting to have two to 300 people but more than 500 people showed up and it was an amazing experience to share the first days with them we've sold um almost 70 percent of the items that were shipped to new york from ukraine which was also a logistically interesting case because we had to get the items from all of our vendors to get to new york safely there were lots of ceramic items there were lots of pieces that could have been broken on the way but still um they came in unharmed uh, to the new york showcase we've also had an amazing outreach in terms of um pr and coverage and this is also thankfully to the people who have been supporting us throughout the way to the journalists and media who were happy to cover who were happy to come and visit and see the showcase for themselves um we also had a placement on uh, Times Square, which was a highlight for all of the projects because this came basically uh, in the last moment and this was a huge support to the project. Um, going through the engagement and uh, social views, uh, we've started from scratch and have organically reached an audience of over uh, 600K, which was amazing. And this means that so many people have at least taken a look at IMER. Um, 500 guests. We've had amazing reviews about the event. And this was, I think this was one of the most cherished notions coming from our guests, both uh, from abroad and from Ukrainians who are staying in New York. So Ukrainians said it felt like they have found themselves somewhere in the center of Kiev and they have met so many people they love there. And um, people from the US were so surprised that we are actually continuing to produce. We're producing so many items and so many cool projects come from Ukraine. And this was the impact that we wanted to achieve most. We wanted to bring that feeling that Ukraine is not a problem, it's a solution. And even in times of war, and perhaps even especially in times of war, we're capable of creating amazing things, which, and we're happy to partner with people in other countries and project in other countries. and. We would love to bring added value to every step that we're making. Um, we also had uh, an amazing possibility to feature the president's speech and our Ministry of Innovation speech during our event. We've held an auction, which was a success, and we've managed to help one more amazing fund that helps um, women who, uh, who went through violations throughout the war. Um, and, um, of course, the exhibition was only possible due to support of the partners, which were very hard to find, but in the end, those were the people who are basically responsible for the half of the success of the event. And we've had so many amazing communications with them, and many ideas and developments of the projects also came from communication with our partners. Um, resilience is the word that came up a lot during the event in preparation to it. And um, 
this was the word that kind of filled all of the content of Ayn Duar, which had a very recognizable uh, visual style. And um, this is because all of the elements of the visual style and the parts of the exhibition inside it were tied to different uh, symbols of cultural significance to Ukrainians uh, created by the amazing creative team that we had. Um, the uh, tables in the exhibition were also a token of appreciation for the architectural monument in, in Kiev, which is called St. Sophia's Cathedral and created by the Archive of Forms and our favorite Forma Studio. Um, you can see how many items are presented and this is only one table and this is how everything went to uh, New York. Um, just a little bit about our team here. You can see the core team, but also there are so, so many people in the background and uh, who played a significant role in making the event happen. Just to quick run through the parts of the exhibition, we had tech, fashion, tradition, youth, and the fair itself. For tradition, our amazing creator, Nadia Shapoval, uh, combined together many parts of Ukrainian culture and tradition. We also brought to the showcase the uh, Tripolian Venus, which has never made it out abroad uh, throughout its existence. And um, the team made it possible and Venus ended up being protected by one more uh, amazing project from Ukraine security system, IAX. Um, these are the part of the ethnography exhibition. Youth was the photography exhibition pulled together by Mashareva, one more part of our creative team. Um, the fair itself uh, contains so many amazing projects and it was such a pleasure to see people kind of walking by, uh, thinking that some of the items are not for sale, but just exhibition pieces, so cool they looked. Um, and for fashion, we had represented one of our um, one of the brightest uh, parts of Ukrainian creativity, whereas fashion designers from Ukraine are known all over the world. And uh, 16 unique designers were represented, and we were so happy to have them with the amazing stands and representation, as well as tech, one of our most favorite parts and one uh, of the parts that we're looking forward to develop with the future events is tech, because so many innovative projects come from Ukraine, such as Dressix, uh, AX, Surface, uh, we play in so much, so many more. Um, and coming coming to the conclusion, um, we wanted to represent and promote Ukraine as we knew it inside of the country with the rich heritage, but also with innovations and culture. And we were so happy that never minding all of the obstacles, all of the problems and challenges that we faced in our way, uh, it still happened and we've reached our, our goal. And um, that is why we've decided to move forward and launch our online platform and continue with our events, uh, the next one being planned in LA, to continue showcasing Ukraine as it is, and maybe even a little bit more, and with the general conclusion being that adversity definitely helps creativity and that there are no obstacles that you cannot overcome on the way to the uh, proper representation of the country. And um, that no matter what, there's just no point in believing any doubts. We can overcome anything and create amazing, amazing things even under extreme pressure. Yep. Girls, that's all for me. If you wanted to, if you wanted to add any words, no, not just. No, we good. I think it's really <laughs> full information. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. So we are on the mission to promote and change the narrative about Ukraine, and also for us, as for the team, it was an important like to experience. It was an important place to experience the war together, and like pulling up this project together. Yeah. Thank you so much, ladies. Truly an incredible undertaking and a remarkable achievement considering the circumstances, considering all of the insurmountable odds, just even bringing every, everyone together to New York, the logistical, all of the organizational details, they are so incredibly massive as anyone who has ever tried to do something like that uh, will know. 
But my, my, my question to you would be this, how did you choose really the image and the main messages of the fair when you were working with such a huge um, and diverse amount of Ukrainian brands in, across all sectors? How did the creative direction uh, behind the project really take place and develop? This is, yeah, Chris, go. Yeah, no, <laughs> you know, like we had a really strong team behind the, standing behind the project. And also like it's the part of them is Google agency who are like pro in PR. So they know how to, how to spread the word. And also like we as Ukrainians, we felt that, we felt that um, there were no like um, right recognition in US. Um, and it was like, it was the image of Ukraine uh, itself in US. It's not that match the reality of what we are doing inside Ukraine. So it was easy, like to that. It was easy to um, to realize that we wanted to change this like narrative and to change to change all this bias in um, in the in the people heads of what Ukraine is. And the uh, yeah, I think something yeah like i can it was, jump. it was quite easy yeah i can just jump it was in quite easy oh, and sorry. also which chris sorry which chris started we have a really a huge creative team yeah so it's artists um they're really uh well known in the world like Macharyeva, Nadia Shapoval, Vanya Herb, Ivan Verbko uh so and they created all our images and uh, all the namings and everything so yeah we like uh working all together on that but um that's why we choose the creative team to be a part of our team right to uh show a real and art ukraine like not only the simple things yeah but just the create the creativity part that's why we have this creative team yeah, Nadia, yeah sorry yeah i just wanted to say that it was also uh, wanted to add about the creative team and it being such a big puzzle just because we've talked to so many people on our way and every message every communication every dialogue kind of added to the messaging and to what we want it to be just because from the questions that they asked and from the emotions and the response that they had to to the event and to the ideas that it had and even to the visual language we've corrected and we've overcorrected. i think it goes a long way saying that our pitch deck for for sponsors and partners had like a thousand of different versions just because after every in team dialogue and every external communication we've added and supplemented a little bit so the because the only thing stayed integral and core that we wanted to show ukraine for war we know it but sometimes from the inside the best things were not very visible so we've taken a little bit from the impressions of the people that we've spoken to and this all went into the event and all of the emotions that we've taken from the first event are going into the next one definitely because we've had so many comments that we didn't even think about as our strong side um and now we're going to highlight them as people noticed some of the things we didn't working on the event throughout every day thank you so much ladies so fascinating to hear nicole and mike i would love to give you the opportunity to ask any questions or maybe give some remarks to the presentation i mean what you all are doing for each other and for your country and for the artists is just incredible i mean it it, <laughs> it really pales in comparison to anything that you know certainly i, I feel like i'm i'm doing uh at the moment it's just um it's incredible. And, and, and just, again, the theme of resilience that you let nothing stop you along this whole journey. And I'm sure there were tons of um, roadblocks, you know, in the way. And um, I just I just think it's remarkable. You know, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can't um, I don't know if I can add any any more than that. I'm, I'm just absolutely um, thrilled to be sitting here with uh, my creative colleagues in Ukraine. And I just, I, I just feel like, um, I feel really moved actually, um, by hearing, you know, you guys talk about your, your creative that you're doing there. So, um, so yeah, thank you for, uh, for, for having me here and for sharing your, your creative with us. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Mike and Nicole. Uh, just a reminder to our virtual audiences today that you can send in your questions or share any feedback or any impressions, um, anything to add to the conversation so far. But Mima, we still have a little bit of time and I'd love to keep this dialogue going. So my question to all of you would be, and if you have any thoughts, please chime in. Sometimes people in the creative sphere have to work with very difficult questions and the world is not perfect. Ukraine is facing so challenges. There are lots of other challenges in the world, but what can creative directors, leaders, visionaries, and pr practitioners do to really make the messaging land and to make it sincere, but also aware and culturally sensitive to difficulties that audiences are going through globally around the world and as parts of society. For the IMUR team, was this even a consideration as you as you went through the planning process? Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, I can start that um, first by saying we had to take it into consideration all the time, even by Starting our event from scratch, we had to go and tell people that we're working on uh, doing something creative or investing into the creative industry, which kind of went maybe not against, but um, well, against the vision of what industries should be supported right now. And this is where we had to find a balance in between saying that, hey, guys, it's important to support creative industry as well. And this got quite sensitive with uh, so many people who supported the actual like humanitarian uh, projects or the projects who were helping people in places. Uh, so this was the first threshold. And then going into, into the communications and, and messaging, we had to be make sure that we do not sound as too much a charity because we didn't, this is not something we wanted. We wanted to show strength, but also to say people that, hey, you can support us. And so it was basically in communication, it was constant balance in between uh, trying to push for our agenda, but then acknowledging all of the other important factors and was a little bit exhausting to be honest, but um, yeah, it was constant work with what people thought with their feedback. We worked a lot with kind of, we did, calls of people from the US of the Ukrainians to make sure we're still staying on the right lane and we're not um, going too much into that or the other direction. Yeah, so like working in the field of cultural diplomacy was quite uh, really exhausting because uh, when you're trying to explain that those people who are presenting the creative economy of Ukraine, they're also like the people who are suffering from the war that are uh, also people who are like um who left their places they are like real uh places and changed the the town they were also in exile so it's not this like just some creative economy it's also the people who are standing behind the businesses and it's also like people who are standing the, behind the businessmen and you know it's yeah it was quite challenging but still uh, we need to win to promote our culture and we need to save it and it's like yeah yeah also wanted to add one thing that we tried to steer clear of we didn't want to talk about the aggressor country too much we wanted to concentrate on ukraine it was sometimes hard even in our first presentations it was kind of like the, the, the word should go in there like we have to say who caused it but then we wanted to concentrate on the things that are going now in ukraine and how the people are fighting it instead of the the things and the, the that that caused this just because it was more important for us to kind of show the impact instead of talking about the reasons we all basically know but this was also hard uh when communicating doing the interviews or the materials because we also had to steer clear of those so that was also one of the moments that we've encountered um well not challenges per se but just um interesting interesting trials and efforts in terms of making it completely understandable for everyone that's reading about us or uh looking throughout our instagram page yeah and it was also our choice to to like to promote the um, the project as a you know with this feeling of vitality that we now like um experience in, in every ukrainian like businessman or creative so and we wanted to tell not like support ukraine but like buy our products they're really 
great. Yeah, it was, so it was the mission. A lot of things to say, and I think that you managed to do it very well. Nicole and Mike, I'm curious to hear, you know, what you both have like long and varied careers. You must have have come up against something similar, balancing sensitive messaging. Do you have any insights on that? Maybe some tips or tricks. <laughs> Mike, you want me to take this one first? Or do you um, so, the, the, um, sorry, the same question proposed to them. Um, just based off of the the question that you proposed to them, um, I, I would just simply say I would distill it down into educate yourself and be open minded. Um, like it's it's very important to to understand all sides of a story, you know, and doing so. Um, the hope would be to be able to, you know, form an educated awareness of a situation as well as an, an empathetic one. But, uh, Nicole, do you have a thought on this? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's the same thing. I mean, I think it really comes down to empathy. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the, the kind of the biggest challenges and, and problems that I had to solve in my career was, um, doing some work for Tommy Hilfiger and they were the first fashion brand that launched uh, a line of fashion for and with people with disabilities. So the with part is extremely important because we spent the whole first year and a half talking to thousands of people, you know, with disabilities. It's actually one in five Americans. I think it's one in four globally identify as having a disability that would make dressing in the morning a challenge. And it was through that year and a half of conversations and learning and really getting into the details um, and just developing that that empathy on a, on a deeper level, not just sort of reading the, the research report level, right? Um, that we were able to, you know, not only help develop the innovations, but then when it came time to really develop the creative for the campaign, um, we just had such a better, you know, deeper understanding. And I, and I think that's kind of what we're all saying in a different way is, is just developing that deeper understanding of the needs of the businesses in Ukraine, the needs of the artists, um, you know, the, the needs of whatever an audience is that you're trying to reach. Yes. Thank you so much. All of that just entirely makes sense. There are so many components to this messaging and so much thought that goes into it. Um, in that context, Nicole, like you mentioned, um, uh, everything evolves, like uh, societal views, laws and policies, and with that, we also evolve with them. But my question to all of you would be, do our contemporary contexts and evolving challenges, have they actually influenced and perhaps changed the meaning of creative work today? And what does that meaning for you specifically? Does anyone like to go first? <laughs> Yeah, I, I can quickly jump in by saying that, um, yeah, for us, definitely creative work has completely shifted into this core understanding that creative industry can, will, and is doing so much to react and, and move all of the things that are happening. And these are basically, as uh, Mike and Nicole brilliantly shared, uh, the the industry the cultural industry is, is never the last one to to kind of show their reaction and it's always done in such a brilliant way and it seems like going further with all of the like with the global crises that are happening creativity creative people and industry would be the first ones to react just because they're always feeling things a little bit differently and it's their opportunity to to speak to so many people and it helps that kind of art and creativity was always something that can touch and speak to anyone because anyone can find their favorite favorite form and and, and expression so it's both very easy to speak to people for creativity but it's also very complicated due to lots of sensitivity and um, lots of emotion put into that but um yeah i would say that in these days creativity just became the core uh, and fundamental value that would that would shift the, the masses that would kind of influence people and hopefully would would make lots of things a little bit better than they are at the moment because definitely looking around you wouldn't say that like the, the world is going completely crazy and creativity is something that can definitely 
hold it together for a little while. Thank you, Nadja. Nicole, maybe you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I, mean, I, I just agree wholeheartedly. I mean, if you think of creativity, it's actually our, our greatest, you know, natural resource. I mean, it, it kind of goes back to the, the very first slide that Mike showed. I mean, it, it's, it's literally impossible to kill a powerful idea. So despite whatever else is going on in the world, ideas, you know, survive and the best ideas make it through into things like IMUR and, and all of these, you know, great innovations. So I, I think despite the circumstances of the world, you know, um, I, I love being part of a, a profession and a global creative community that, you know, is really, you know, irrepressible um, despite, despite circumstances. Irrepressible, indomitable, absolutely agree. And this is such a true also ex expression and description of the Ukrainian spirit, I think, personally. <laughs> uh, Mike, uh, you talked a little bit about uh, about the, the concept that idea, an idea cannot be killed. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes root, it grows, it changes. My question to you and anyone else who has any thoughts is what can we learn about the inherent resilience of ideas and perhaps adapt it to our everyday creative work? Oh boy, uh, the resilience of ideas adapting to our, our, our creative work. Um, uh, well, I, th Nicole, do you wanna <laughs> jump okay, well, on this? We, we chat a little bit about we this. Should, we each have a, a perspective on this, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I think a lot of it is, um, you know, th and there's a great Steve Jobs quote where he talks about, you know, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect the dots looking backwards. So I think sometimes we forget to maybe look at, look at our past history, look at our mistakes, look at our successes. You know, I always love going and talking to people who have been in this industry like way longer than, than I have because only they have the perspective, right? Of what led to resilience in the past. So I think in an industry that's so focused on the next thing, like, let's not forget to look back at, again, you know, mistakes, successes, you know, what can we learn from them? How can we connect the dots and then apply that to our work moving forward? So that's just kind of my personal point of view on it. But I, I do think that it impacts the industry, you know, as a whole. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, just speaking to the idea that, like, I, ideas never die there's a there's another component to that which is i believe to just keep generating things and putting it out into the world as a reflection of what is happening in the world and and that i, th I feel like that's really important um and in it and it becomes really uh relevant uh but 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 keep putting stuff in the world so that's what i would say and i think that's actually how like social media and like just all the advancements in technology it's so much faster now to put an idea out in the world like you know when mike and i first began in this industry 20 plus years ago the the time it took to actually kind of get a creative idea out there was was a lot longer time and i think that's one of like the really things about um you know all of the technology we have today and and social media and that if you have, yeah, you know it can spread like wildfire you know very quickly and really make an impact Thank you. Um, I just want to share a, a phrase that Ole Kutinenka, who is the founder of the largest uh, charity in Ukraine that is focused on providing support to pediatric oncology patients and their um, and their families. It grew from a very small initiative to really one of the largest charities, and she's done incredible work. And once during a program of America House Kiev, she said a phrase that for her teamwork. Uh, that for her creativity is a team exercise. This is how she approaches it. And I know that from the IMUR team, uh, you've worked so much together and you've definitely supported each other through these hard times. And Mike and Nicole, I also know that you have had a really long and fruitful creative partnership and collaboration. Can um, both of you, uh, both of the teams kind of, so to speak, speak a little bit about how these creative partnerships have helped you in your practice and also perhaps building your own personal resilience? Uh, maybe Nicole, you would like to go first. <laughs> Nicole, might. Yeah, as you 
mean, Mike and I have, have truly had a, a 20 plus year um, creative partnership and friendship. We were paired together uh, by our, our former boss and, and a good friend of both of ours, John Butler, you know, many years ago. And um, look, you know, it, everything about creativity comes down to relationships. And when you have great relationships and you have a trust, um, you know, you can really build anything together. And I mean, Mike, you know, you might want to speak to that. We, we don't we don't always see eye to eye on a creative idea, but that's where that pushing and pulling and bending, I think, comes to make it better. But yeah, that, and that's exactly it. Um, you know, I th I feel like we have our um, cer certainly creativity can be about ego. Ego is a very important part of creativity. But um, but if you're able to sort of let that go and uh, a little bit and um, you know uh, you know author something with with a partner who shares maybe different viewpoints. I think it's one of the, the greatest lessons you can learn is, and, and even learning sometimes you're wrong, right? Sometimes you're wrong with something. And um, in which Nicole has told me many, many times before. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But, um, but yeah, I would say that's, that's a really important thing to learn, to learn from that. So. Thank you. Nadia, Anya, uh, Anna, what about you? How has your team helped you become more resilient? Um, I think it was constantly definitely about teamwork, just because it's especially for those staying in Ukraine, but also, for example, our connection with Anna, who is in LA, and it was it's somehow even harder to to communicate with with your Ukrainian relatives and friends and teammates who are in Ukraine when you are abroad, just because the um, like the nerves are there. And so the team and the constant touch and just communicating with each other and sharing ideas was something that was keeping us sane. And whenever so we worked throughout all of the chats and email and everything. So it was always a place not only to go with work issues, but also to like whenever you're stressed out or something's not going the way you planned, it was always the go to place for any kind of any kind of stress or or crazy ideas, which also some of them ended up being implemented into life. So um, yeah, teams just just starting from communication and to brainstorming an idea which you didn't think was true to its value, but then the team, you kind of throw it to the team and somehow throughout the 15 minute, minute call, it becomes something something very, very easy, easily manageable and then which which can come to life. It's It's an amazing thing and we have witnessed it so many times and so many kind of fires and crises were solved due to specifically team effort because definitely alone we we didn't stand a chance first mentally just because it's there's no way you're going through all of the emotions both with the war and with preparing the event alone and then with the amount of work that has been happening teamwork all the way yeah, this is true. And I would like to add that uh, the Ukrainian people and also my team, it's like the strongest people in the world right now. Because from the very first day, our agency never stopped their work for a day, like never. Uh, they work from the bombshell, they work from the I don't know where. And when I came to Ukraine in November, I just want to visit them and um, get my dad to US. Uh, it was our first day we created the strategy for the agency. And it was like a really huge bombs in Kiev. Nobody even like moved from the office. Like nobody, everybody said, okay, guys, we have a strategy right now, please don't waste our time. Let's do that. We are not going anywhere. I'm like sitting and looking at them and thinking, oh my God, they are robots. Like they're unbelievable. Like Ukrainian people is so strong. So I even don't know if will something happen without the team. I'm only the team, um, like I'm team builder and uh, i'm team player so um yeah we have now the strongest nation i think and we can create a lot a lot of uh, creative things like in future so ukraine and ukrainian creatives have a really big and huge opportunity to show our culture to show uh, how how real 
cool and creative we are. So that's why, yeah, we are create I am you are to show that no matter what, no matter how, we can create the best event about Ukraine in the world. Yeah, and this is our ambition, and it will be. So yeah, Slava Ukraini. Slava. Anna, thank you so much. Um, and I think that really this entire conversation, this entire series illustrates the point that when your creative work has a purpose, you can keep going. When you have a strong team, you can keep going. And even though it might seem like it might, that it's so difficult at the worst of times to bring that light forward, to bring those ideas, for some, it might allow them to create the very best work that they have ever had. And I hope that this energy will persist even after and that all of us find ways to recharge. And um, as we wrap up this conversation, this is a question to Anna, to Nadia, and to Chris specifically, in what ways can the world support Ukrainian creatives today? How can they work with them? How can they support him? <laughs> they can work, work with them. Yeah, they can like uh, collaborate with uh, with the Ukrainian artists, designers. Um, I don't know, like yeah, I think it's it's the um, it's really because Ukrainian talent is incredible. So and we as Ukrainians, we love to work. Uh, so yeah, just like uh, collaboration, uh, working together. Like, through yeah. Uh, for our agency, it's the main goal right now to do a collaboration with the huge brands or huge names, yeah, to, because we have a really cool artist and we have a great ideas which we can, like, give to, I don't know, Marnie Prada or somebody like that, yeah, and our designers like Ruslan Baginski or somebody else, they're working with Beyonce and all other uh, the celebrities that's what we need right now to like to spread the information to spread the talents and also we really need um you know this belief in creative economy and investing in a creative economy because nobody right now do not thinking about it and they don't want to invest uh like funds to creative economy because like they have more um like more meaningful things like how, how they think like they, maybe uh to rebuild the ukraine to i don't know help children and everything like that yeah but creative economy it's our future this artist will like uh they bring the money to our country later right so we really need this some <laughs> angel investors or somebody who will uh invest in our artists invest in the events like that invest to like buy some i don't know pictures or anything right so yeah i think this is the main points what we need collaborations invest invest uh, investing investments. and investments yeah and to buy our products thank you so much to all of our viewers it might take a little bit of legwork, but seeking out Ukrainian creatives is so worth it. They're present on all of the main platforms, on Behance, on Instagram. Uh, you will definitely find something new and something inspiring for yourself. As we wrap, as we wrap up the conversation, Nicole and Mike, I would just uh, love to ask you for any final remarks, any final ideas you would like to share with our viewers today. No, I mean, again, I, I'm just so blown away by the work of, of the, the three you know, colleagues that have joined us today. Um, we are all, you know, rooting and cheering for Ukraine, you know, every single day we're behind you. Um, and kind of just to go back to the, the reference from Keith Herring from earlier, you know, there's always another idea, there's always another day. And uh, I think certainly um, my, my Ukrainian colleagues on the, the call are a testament to the, the power of that. So thank you so much for having me. Thank yeah, you. I think we'll leave it with that, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Nadia, Chris, Anna, any final remarks for our viewers today? Um, we just wanted to say thank you so much for having us. It's so important. So this is one of the points that kind of connects all of the dots and the support can be shown through informational shares. It's always, there's never uh, a situation when you cannot share in network. And so this is very helpful to spread the information and to, it's an honor to also share the floor with Mike and Nicole. Thank you so much for your inspiration. And um, 
yeah, it's where our resilience is only possible thanks to all of the people who have been showing us immense support from all points of the world. And um, this, this, this is the, the huge thank you to goes to all of the people who are listening, sharing, uh, sending, sending help or helping in any other ways. This is just priceless. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for doing this and for organizing and for having us. Thank you for joining us for this dialogue between American and Ukrainian creatives. And thank you to all our viewers for joining us today on this beautiful sunny evening in Kiev. And I hope that it's a similarly beautiful and peaceful morning in New York and in Los Angeles and all over the world. Uh, please tune in and look for updates on our upcoming sessions, part of the Creative Resilience in Times of War series. Thank you and have a good evening. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks.